Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor for episode 80. Thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedules for a few minutes to spend with me on this episode where I'll go through some news items of the last week or so. So let me get right into it. Now, we've been talking over the last few shows about the global sales of EVs from 2019 that they have risen, albeit slower than some analysts would like to predict. And one of the reasons, I think, is the cost. And I've talked about cost parity for EVs and we haven't achieved that yet. Was well, an article came out actually from Sandy Monroe. And if auto people follow Sandy Monroe, they know that he does teardowns and rebuilds and this kind of stuff of cars and, and produces reports about them. Very famous auto journalist. And he is respected. Sometimes uh, what he has to say isn't always the greatest, but uh, he is a pretty smart guy. Well, he did this study about the electric versus ice or internal combustion vehicle breakdown as far as costs go for the vehicles. And here's a chart that shows um, what the percentages are of each of the major components within a vehicle, both an electric vehicle and a internal combustion vehicle. And as you can see, about 51% or the majority is the powertrain. And that powertrain consists of, oh, oh, of course, the battery packs, the inverters, the controllers, and the motors and transmission. Really, it's a single gear transmission uh, that an EV uses. Um, so and of course, the battery pack component of all those components is one of the most expensive. And if you've been following the um, all electric marketplace for the last several years, you've seen that battery pack prices have fallen from well over $1,000 US per kilowatt hour down to, well, what is it now, 140, 130, somewhere around that range US. So we've, we've seen quite the, the dramatic decrease in pricing However, uh, for the battery packs, however, we have really seen that passed to EV vehicles. Why, you ask? Well, it's a good question. Um, you know, there are more um, technologies that are going to be moving forward over the next few years to decades. You know, solid state batteries, lithium sulfur, all of them promising to be cheaper, lighter, safer and more energy dense than, of course, our, our lithium ion that we're used to using now. My personal take on the real reason why we haven't seen prices drop is twofold. One is that automakers haven't really spooled up enough resources yet to be producing all electric vehicles, in this case um, that I'll talk about, uh, to the economies of scale that they would like for profit margins. And second of all, um, they're greedy on releasing any of those profit margins uh, and giving away any money to the general public or to consumers. Um, I find it highly unlikely, as an example, that the Nissan Leaf still is a $45,000 Canadian car for uh, a mid-tier level, where a fully loaded Honda Civic is twenty-eight dollars to $30,000 Canadian, as an example. So that $15,000 or so cost disparity, I, I don't see why it still has to be, considering where prices have come down a lot. Now, maybe it's because Nissan doesn't produce a whole ton of these and their cost to produce or production are higher and battery prices, yes, they fall and are still not low enough to really impact cost parity. And that's where a lot of analysts are predicting that we'll hit cost parity within the next, well, some say by 2025, some say by 2024. I think it's a tad longer, sometime between 2025 and 2030. Um, might even be, you know, I doubt it. it's going to be into the next decade, but certainly this decade when we hit cost parity. So anyway, just something for you to chew on and think about as far as, uh, again, barriers to adoption. One of them is the price and why uh, EVs are priced the way they are still, but hopefully it will get better. Now, on to auto manufacturers and automakers, Nikola has claimed that um, they are building the most advanced electric truck, or pickup truck in this case. <laughs> Boy, it seems like we're going to hear a lot of this now as the pickup market heats up in the SUVs. Nikola has just revealed its Badger electric pickup truck concept. Remember, folks, this is a concept. Now, they've given out some specs. They estimate about 600 mile range. Now, this is a blended figure. This is a unique concept where they're introducing, introducing um, hydrogen as well as battery alone options or, or power, uh, powertrains within this uh, concept. So 300 miles on battery range only, uh, and double that when you add in the use of hydrogen. So it seems pretty impressive. You know, yeah, th under three seconds, zero to 60, all that kind of stuff you can reserve now, or, or, or sorry, reservations will open sometime um, following uh, September of this year when they actually official, officially debut this, uh, this pickup truck. No pricing, of course, but I'm sure it'll be in line with 
either the Cybertruck or the Rivian or a combination of the two. Um, so obviously this adds to that lineup. Now Nik Nikola is um, known mostly for the zero emission semi trucks, which they've been bringing to market quite successfully. But this one is going to be interesting with that combination fuel cell and all electric capabilities. But anyway, you know, that pickup truck truck market and SUV market is heating up from an all electric standpoint. It's great to see another player in the game. Quick article for my friends in Europe, um, Opel Ampera E, which is the European equivalent of the Chevy Bolt here in North America. Uh, it was introduced by GM before Opel actually acquired the PSA group. Um, and of course, soon our, uh, will retire as the company was will build its own Opel Corsa E, as you've seen in my show in the past, and I'm sure you've seen on the internet. So what this this means for European customers is that in the in the last few markets where the uh, Opel Ampera E is still available, you can purchase this as a really good incentive. And I talked about some of the Bolt incentives going on in the U.S. So it seems like these are being carried over into Europe that you can purchase or lease the car cheaper than ever before. As an example, in the Netherlands, the price starts at just uh, over thirty four thousand euros, uh, which is about ten thousand, almost eleven thousand euros below the previous starting price of almost forty. 8,000 euros. There's limited supply, so first come, first serve on these vehicles. These were all imported from the U.S., and it looks like they're just trying to blow these things out before they switch model lines. So, any of my friends out in Europe get one of these, please send me an email or leave a comment on YouTube. I'd love to hear your story and what you think of the vehicle. It's certainly a very capable all-electric vehicle. Piece of quick Tesla news, uh, Elon had tweeted out and announced that the uh, latest version of the Model S, which is a beautiful car, the Long Range Plus, already pretty well the long range leader from a uh, all electric battery range perspective is now even farther. That it's now been tweaked to go up to 390 miles of range. Um, and it looks like the Model X is getting a tweak as well to go up to boost it up to 351 miles of range. These are EPA numbers. Um, and Elon has its sights set on the 400 mile range for the Model S at some point in time. Uh, great that they continue to tweak the batteries and tweak the software to harness more out of these Teslas and good on them. Excellent. Just some quick spy shots. Uh, sometimes I like to pull out these and show them to you folks about some testing going on by Volkswagen Group on the ID4, which of course is scheduled here for North America. Doesn't seem like they're too worried about hiding this thing because it's not running in camo gear. Uh, here's some pictures of what the ID4 is looking like, not really in disguise. It's formally uh, supposed to be introduced at the auto show in April, but it looks like Volkswagen has decided to postpone that announcement. Uh, without offering a reason, I think the reason is probably is they want to really kind of make sure they hone down their production timelines and target dates really, really clear. And they may not be there yet as they still spool up their plants that might have been behind on some uh, retooling for some of the plants. A Zikau plant, excuse me, in Germany is going to be one of the main plants uh, producing these. Um, these ID4s, especially uh, until they'll be shipped across from Germany to North America, until they get Chattanooga in Tennessee up, which is going to be another couple of years by the sounds of things. So um, looks like they might they might actually provide more information at the Detroit Auto Show, which is in June, but that's not been confirmed. Anyway, nice looking vehicle. Um, you know, this is uh, the first North American bound VW that's going to be based on the all new MEB platform, of course. And uh, it's targeted to start production in Germany at the end of this year for shipments into North America sometime in 2021, possibly into 2022. We'll have to wait and see because uh, I, I take these dates a little vaguely. And as we get closer to things actually happen, then I take them a bit more serious. But anyway, some good shots of a very nice looking all electric vehicle. Here's a couple of minute video that uh, some excerpts from the fully charged USA show that I was down a couple of weeks ago mentioned to you folks that I would release some information over the next course of uh, these next couple of weeks. So here's an interview that I had with their chief engineer at Rivian Motors. I was very excited to meet with them. I do apologize for some of the mic noise. It sounds like I got some interference on my wireless mic while I was talking and didn't really realize it until later on when I was uh, reviewing the material. And unfortunately, I had already left uh, Austin. So anyway, here's my interview with Rivian. Check it out. All my viewers, uh, you know, I pump them full of information about Rivian, about what you guys are doing. But what I wanted to do is just get a quick couple of minutes from me about how, first of all, how, how has this event been for you? This is an amazing event. 
Uh, fully charged event and you know the the clientele that attend this event they already pretty into, in, into EVs we're having a great time the conversations are always good because so many people are technically uh, capable get competent they come up and ask difficult questions and I, I enjoy that we've got a lot of pre-order customers as well so that engagement I always enjoy it I, I attend a lot of these events just for that interaction we gain a huge amount of knowledge about what our customer base really is and also get the like a, a lot of people like to come and give us ideas about what they want in their car and that's excellent so yeah this this is good, good fun. Well, you know, that's a great point, uh, Charles, is that feedback mechanism, right? Because, you know, you, you, you've got, you know, version A of the product, and as you're developing to get to version A out the door in that production run, you're getting all this input from people that are, you know, it's likely owners that have put money down and saying, you know, I, I love it, but it would be great if I had X, Y. Are you, uh, is your thought to maybe incorporate some of those into some of the releases uh, that come out? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we've, we've been doing these events for quite some time and a lot of those ideas are already incorporated what you see today these vehicles are kind of four or five months old since they were built and they were built back then on kind of um, reasonably recent engineering drawings etc but a lot has moved on so we, we talk about when we open the doors of the car the interior in these vehicles is not really a hundred percent representative but it gives that theme it gives the design theme and style so we get to talk about it uh, and that drives a lot of commentary about what people want we do try to incorporate as much as we can. The vehicles you see today already are like behind incorporating some of those ideas. They are, and I often talk to people I saw at a previous event, and they say, hey, have you thought about that? Remember we talked about this? I'm like, yes, it's in. It's just not in this car yet because these cars are, are getting old now. Um, the reality is we take all of that feedback. If it makes engineering sense to, to build it, we can do it at a price point that we think... That's not, that's not a Rivian going past. That's, <laughs> Uh, if we can do it at a price point that we think we, we'll, we'll sell, we're definitely going to put it in because we just want to satisfy our customer base. We're pretty much frozen on engineering design at the moment. Uh, we, we're trying to get the pickup truck done for the end of the year. The SUV will follow three months later. Okay. Um, but we have a roadmap of products that are coming out and all the feedback we get all the time is, is going into that. Excellent. Uh, things I noticed just from looking at the, the pre-production is the quality of the workmanship. I mean, I'm, you know, I haven't been able to sit inside and poke, but just from what I can see and poke my head in and look at, it's it's outstanding. I mean, you know, I've sat in the, the Jaguar I-Pace and, and Lincolns and all this other stuff, but you guys are really pumping that kind of what you want to do is that's all on purpose. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we chose a benchmark set of vehicles and we said we want to be better than this benchmark set. And then again, it's got to be at a relevant price point. So it is always a difficult balance to find. We have to choose the materials and find the execution that matches. But the reality is for our, uh, for our customer, we want to deliver that quality and I think we're on path to do that. It's, um, you know, it's just a fun challenge. You don't, you don't necessarily have to, it doesn't have to be more expensive. You just have to be really deliberate about the engineering practice that you put into the design. And that's what you know, and even even small things like your use of space, you know, use the little nooks and crannies, and you know the brilliant uh, bed approach to the storage space, you know, behind the seats. I mean, I haven't seen that before. Usually, you'll see an in, uh, you know, uh, an in bed over box kind of approach to storage. But I thought that you know this kind of thing is brilliant. So is that is now is your chief engineer is maybe or that's uh, well. I don't want to take responsibility for too much, honestly. Like it's a it's a big team that we have, and uh, a lot of people putting in ideas all across the place. Actually, the gear tunnel you talk about is my favorite feature on all the vehicles. I, honestly, it, it changes. It's a game changer for pickup trucks because it's more lockable space, and the the front itself already changes what a pickup truck is. You know where. A traditional pickup truck just has a bed and maybe a tonneau cover. We now have a lockable, well, the tonneau cover is also a hard tonneau cover if you want. That's, a, that's one of those specifications, so that can be lockable. But the ha just having a gear tunnel and the frunk as additional lockable space, suddenly it creates a new use case for a five-seat pickup truck. That's, for me, that's, that's fantastic. It's, now it's my baby. Uh, I'm only kind of recently the chief engineer, so I am I'm taking custodian of a lot of other people's genius work. I'm still trying to add my, my bit in this and actually uh, to execute it, get it through to production. This is a, a tough challenge and honestly, you've got a good team behind me. Will really be a year of progression for you because you'll have everything worked out. The whole machine will be humming. Um, what, do you, what do you think about going on in 2021? Wow. Um, so ultimately, it's a fairly slow ramp up. And that's you know that's pretty normal. We need to we need to build up the speed in the production line, make sure that the quality so every vehicle that goes off the line reaches that quality that we expect, and that takes time to build up the speed. 
Uh, so that's hence the slow ramp up. Uh, 2021, the SUV comes out on top of the pickup truck, so then we the, the line becomes more complex. Uh, and in parallel, you're probably aware that the um, Amazon pick the Amazon uh, delivery vehicle is is also being developed and will be yeah. you know in parallel happening in the in the plant. So it's a lot of there's a lot of engineering all, all in the same plant, right? All, all in the same plant. Yeah. Um, so that's all pretty exciting. But at the, you know, as these products go into market, the second round of products are being developed. Like I said, there's a roadmap that defines kind of the, the similar concept, the adventure vehicle. But we want to expand on that. There's a lot of reusable architecture, the the powertrain, the modules we put in the battery. Um, a, a lot of this vehicle can be reused into something of a different package. In fact a plethora of different packages, which is what we're working on now. You know, that's a super exciting, Charles. And as my viewers know, I'm super stoked about you guys. Really wish you all the best of success. And it's a phenomenally looking product. This is my first time I've actually had a chance to physically see it and get close to it and talk to some of your folks. You guys have been outstanding all weekend, and I really appreciate that you guys came out to Fully Charge USA. And I hope to get down to Illinois at some point when you're, when you're doing that and see the facility and uh, see how it's going. Thank you, Kenneth. A pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that information, a little bit of tidbit and some nuggets, hopefully there. Rivian is certainly excited about coming to the North America and the global marketplace as they prepare for some beautiful looking machines. Uh, thank you very much to Rivian for taking the time to talk to me at Fully Charge. Now, quickly, I just want to get into a quick mailbag, and I haven't had mailbag for a while, so that's great. I mean, I do get emails, folks, and I do get comments from time to time, and uh, I do people uh, get people that mostly comment on the show. I don't get a lot, a ton of questions. This is more of a thank you and, and just uh, kind of somebody letting me know what's happened with them. Uh, there's a viewer in the UK. His name is Willis. And he's a subscriber, and thank you very much for Willis for watching and subscribing to my show. And he just sent me this lovely note with this picture that you're seeing, and it just basically says that he and his family have gone all electric, and they thank me in part for helping with their decisions to go all electric. And in fact, they've replaced three tailpipes with EVs. As you can see, they've got Zoe's. He's got his own Zoe, which he's been driving for. Uh, in fact, his dad has one that he has. He's had just over a year, and his dad's in his early 80s. So. Congrats. Congratulations. You're never too old to go electric. Excellent. I love to hear that. His uncles, he bought his car last summer and he's in his mid 70s and he's got his own Zoe since uh, 2016, 2017. So great to see. The Zoe's are great cars. Uh, I've ridden in a lot of them when I was in the UK and a lot of my friends have them. Great to see that. Um, Willis, I thank you very much for sending that. And hey, great to see three less tailpipes on the road. All right, well, that's it for this edition of the EV Revolution Show, episode 80. A little bit quicker. I had some great information to share on what's going on in some of the manufacturers. Thank you very much for watching. As always, thank you very much for subscribing and commenting and liking. And if you want to dislike, fine, go ahead. <laughs> it's a free world, that's for sure. On YouTube, I really appreciate uh, all the comments and interaction that happens. And thank you very much. Look, if you haven't subscribed, I really, really hope you would. I won't annoy you with a lot of emails and spam and this kind of stuff. You'll get notified when I push a show up. Please subscribe if you haven't. Uh, that would mean a lot to me. And of course, thank you very much. I'm always humbly, humbly uh, indebted to my Patreon supporters. Thank you very much for what you do every month in helping me continue this. Uh, it does take some effort and financial doing to keep this show going and to keep my endeavors uh, in what I do. So I thank you for that. If you're interested, check out the website. Even a dollar a month, if you'd like, will help. Um, you know, help every bit helps me in continuing to put these shows together as I plan for more stuff. And now that I don't have any more fully charged stuff to promote anymore, <laughs> I mean, there's the UK show coming up. Uh, I am, I will announce, folks, that I am not going to that show. Unfortunately, I just don't have uh, the bandwidth to be able to do that show after just doing the Austin show um, in February here. Um, I just got a lot of stuff going on with work and stuff, and I just don't uh, just don't have the bandwidth to do that. So I do, uh, I, I do wish all my friends out in the UK. I'll be a little sad not seeing them this year, but uh, it is what it is. And I know Fully Charged will have a great third year. They are going to go ballistic over there. Things are happening really, really well over there. So again, thanks everybody for watching the show, for continuing. If you are an EV advocate and you're out there promoting it through a club or an organization, or or just on your own, thank you for doing that because that means a lot. It really is a grassroots effort to get information out and I appreciate it just as much as a lot of the folks appreciate what I'm doing here on the show. It's right back at you folks and thank you very much. So everybody uh, please stay safe and until the next show I'll see you when I see you. Take care. Bye-bye.